are ready for another wonderful, inspiring session with all of these great young people that have come in from all over the United States and from some other countries of the world. And I have with me Olivia Knott. And Olivia and uh, Braxton are going to be our host and hostess for, uh, during this time. And we welcome you. We're so glad you're with us. Thank you. This is really exciting because as an executive committee, we've been praying earnestly that God would send his Holy Spirit to, to be over this conference. The theme this year is fill me our earnest plea. But you know, I don't think God is stingy. I think he has enough of his blessing to go around. So um, I, I welcome you to watch us live on TV. And um, I'm sure God will bless you also. Amen. And you know something? Uh, GYC and 3ABN have been partners from the very beginning. Uh, we are so pleased to be a part of this movement, uh, to be able to bring these programs to you. And uh, it's through your support that we're able to do that because it's, it doesn't, uh, it's not just an easy thing for us to pick up and come to Houston, Texas and get ready for a production like this. You be praying for us, pray for this session, and pray for these young people as they gather together. I have grown to believe that the church is in great hands with the young people of GYC. And I believe that God is going to use these young people to finish the work. And may God bless you, each one. Amen. Is this something I could come to, or will I feel a little bit out of place? No, absolutely not. This time is a time where you'll be able to reflect even silently. And just hearing other people's prayers are powerful. Because when I'm in there just listening to other people's prayers, I learn how to pray as well as be blessed by other people's prayers. And it's a time for me to silently pray as well. Well, Melissa, thank you for sharing with us about the prayer meeting that's been taking place in room 360 AD, just a couple floors above us. And I want to encourage each one of you to take at least half an hour, an hour, and spend in the prayer meeting this conference. Thanks a lot, Melissa. Thank Appreciate you, you coming us. forward. So we've talked about our seminars. We've discussed a little bit about some of the options we have to spend significant time in prayer with our maker. Grace, another component of our conference is small groups. What's that all about? Well, Sean, I first want to mention how excited we are about small groups this year because we believe that God has amazing blessings in store for us. And we believe that community is so important for support and for encouragement and to strengthen our faith. And what we want to do this year at Small Group is to create that open, intimate, but a safe environment for everyone to come and share what God is doing in their lives and what he's um, been teaching you and also to discuss what you will be learning during the week at the seminars this week. So small groups take place, it sounds like, almost every day. And yes. when do they happen? Well, it's happening starting tonight at 8.15 to 9 o'clock, and it will go through Sabbath. So 8.15 to 9 o'clock, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sabbath. Yes. And is there something that the discussions will be based on? Um, well, I know because we already talked about it, but you right. have something in your book. Why don't you, yes. oh, in your hand, why don't you share with us about that? Right. So GYC this year has provided us with uh, Mark Finley's 10 Days in the Upper Room for us to use for small groups this year. And um, this is an incredible book to utilize because you can also use it for your personal devotions and come and share with us um, during small groups within your groups. Now, I was flipping through this a little bit earlier, and I hope you received this. And, and you mentioned if you don't have one, um, they can pick it up at the small group room tonight right, uh, af right. after the meeting. But I was noticing there were, there were 10 chapters, one for each day. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we were thinking is if you look in your program booklet, you'll notice that every morning before morning devotion, there is a time set aside for your personal devotions. And we want to encourage you to kind of, well, get a step ahead of what the small groups will be doing and, and spend some time in the morning doing your personal devotions, uh, going through the material that is here about prayer that Elder Finley has put together for us. And, and I encourage you as, as you go through, you'll, you'll see some quotes and scriptural references, and you may want to grab your iPhone or your iPad and look those up on the Ellen White estate, some of the quotes from Mrs. White, or grab your Bible and look up those Bible texts and allow this to really be a meaningful experience for you as you spend time with your Creator each day. So we'll be prepared. Yes by our morning devotions for what takes place at the small groups in the evening. 
And I also noticed, uh, Grace, that uh, it looked like this is a little bit interactive. There's some questions and discussion things, and so I need a pen or a pencil or yes, something um, to write stuff with, right? It's ki it kind of works like a workbook, and you will have a pen provided. So you definitely want to fill out your thoughts and what you're learning as you um, have your personal devotions with this book, and you can definitely um, write your thoughts and share with us during small groups. Well, great. Grace is our small groups coordinator here at GYC this year. Thank you for sharing with us a little bit about small groups. And can I keep this? Sure. I appreciate that. Thank you. So seminars, prayer, small groups, and of course, GYC would not be GYC without what? Evangelism. How are we going to do evangelism this year? After all, it looks like everyone here knows Jesus. Well, this year on Friday, we have our outreach day. And every year, this is my favorite part. You probably hear that every year. But the reason I especially love outreach day and evangelism is because evangelism is the very heart of Christianity. If, if we lose our focus on evangelism, which is of utmost importance, we will cease to fulfill the mission God has called us to. And there's two reasons that I want to bring up tonight of why I believe we must have evangelism at this conference. Friday is just one opportunity you have. There's many throughout this convention. But one is simply because Christ asked us to do it, right? It's our commission. If we love him, if we trust him, whether we understand why he would have us do this crazy thing of, of sharing with other people, we're going to do it. And we experience those blessings every year. I have the privilege of hearing testimony after testimony. People come back into the room and they say, I, I went on that bus and I arrived at this door and God orchestrated everything. So at that moment, I met that person and they were open to hearing about Christ. They received Bible studies. And then I get to hear about the church members studying with them and them coming to an evangelistic series, them being baptized. And even some I've seen a couple years later active in the church. I get to see this, but there's one other blessing, one other miracle I want to quickly share with you that we don't always talk about, and that is the blessing of character development, the other reason I believe we must do evangelism. I see every year people go out door to door and they don't want to go. I see them hesitant. I see them kind of stepping backwards, and I believe a host of angels gets them to that bus. They get on that bus and through the encouragement of, of their neighbor, they pray much and they, they go to that door and they don't want to do it. Evangelism outreach shows our motives, our heart more than anything else, reveals our selfishness, who we are. But, but through that experience, through that seeing our own weakness, we depend on Christ's strength. And I see over and over people come back and say, I did not want to do that. But I saw that I needed Christ and I went forward and I didn't have the words, the Holy Spirit gave them to me, and I watched God use me in a way I never have before. I was waiting for you to mention the Holy Spirit, because evangelism seems to make a whole lot of sense, especially at a conference focused on the Holy Spirit. Why is that? We cannot share. If we share of our own words, it means nothing. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit in order for the Lord to reach people's hearts. We can't reach the heart. But we... I've seen over and over the miracles of God speaking through attendees here at the door, in the convention center, in the hotels, and churches revived, church members excited about evangelism, all because of this one day and people allowing God to fill them and to use them. And I could tell you story after story, but instead of me sharing with you many other people's story, I want you to come Friday, allow God to use you to speak through you to develop your character, to use you to share, and allow him to write your own story. Chelsea, thank you for sharing with us about evangelism, and we look forward to allowing those angels to shove us out those doors and onto those buses on Friday afternoon. Thank you. Well, we've looked at our conference theme. We've looked at the components of our conference, seminars, prayer, small groups, and evangelism. And as we continue, I want to encourage you to keep three central issues in mind. First of all, even though this is a conference about the Holy Spirit, Jesus has to be central. Jesus is who we focus on. 
Jesus is the one who came and lived as one of us and gave his life on our behalf. Jesus is the one who sends the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one that the Holy Spirit testifies of. In fact, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit ministers in the shadow of Jesus. So, let's keep Jesus central. Amen? Amen. Secondly, Bible study and prayer are essential. We can't just rely on feelings or intuitions. We need the Word of God. And so we're going to pour through the pages of Scripture. We're going to see all of the inspired counsel that God has to share with us about the Holy Spirit. We want to be grounded in divine inspired counsel. And then prayer. Prayer that flows from our study of Scripture. Prayer that is informed by Scripture. Prayer that is founded upon the inspired counsel we find in God's Word. And then thirdly, as Chelsea shared with us, evangelism. The Holy Spirit is given for evangelism. The Holy Spirit's not given to make you feel happy. The Holy Spirit's not given to move me to tears doing an appeal. The Holy Spirit is given to propel and compel God's people to take the gospel to the entire world. Each evening here at GYC, we're going to have a representative of our church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, pray for us and pray that God would bless this conference. We're beginning this evening with David, and David is a pastor here in one of the local conferences of, that is represented by Houston. And David, would you take us to God's throne? Would you pray and ask that the Holy Spirit would bless us, that he be poured out, and that our lives would be transformed? Good evening, GYC. Good evening. On behalf of the Texas Conference, I just want to welcome you guys to Houston, Texas. How many of you guys are excited to be here? Amen. Amen. I know I'm excited. I brought a uh, group of young people from my church here at Keene Spanish, uh, which is close to Fort Worth, Texas, and I know they've been waiting a long time for this event. So I know they're excited as well as uh, I am. I'm very excited to be here. And so I hope that the rest of you are excited. We just want to uh, ask that the Holy Spirit be in our midst during this weekend, uh, that he will impact our lives and that he will fill us this weekend. If you would bow your heads with me as we will ask the Holy Spirit to fill us. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for bringing each and every young person here, Lord, safely. Thank you for traveling mercies, Lord. We ask that this weekend may be a spiritual weekend. May we be filled with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Be with the speakers and be with those who are going to listen, Lord. May you impact us in a powerful way, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our speaker tonight is no doubt no stranger to GYC. In fact, he almost needs no introduction at GYC. Yet, it's my privilege to introduce to you tonight our speaker, the president of GYC, Justin McNeilis. Now, Many of you may know who Justin is, but you don't know Justin. And those of us who've had the privilege to be able to work with him for a couple of years have gotten to know him just a little bit better. We know how much he loves the Lord and how committed he is to him and how that plays out in the way that he works here at GYC. We know that once he gets an idea into his mind that young people can accomplish something, that there's no stopping him from seeing through that idea from coming into completion. Um, Justin is an incredible leader to work with, and he is, has our complete respect. And his wife, I asked his wife earlier today what I should say or what I should not say in introducing him. And she said, don't forget that he would never hesitate to embarrass somebody up front. Um, so I tried to think of an embarrassing story to share with Justin, but really there was nothing to share but, not, but respect for the work that he has to do with us. And I think the thing that we respect the most about Justin as the president of our organization and as the leader in this movement is the fact that he's a man of prayer. That every idea, that every problem, that every obstacle that he has, he takes into prayer with the Lord. And before we begin with this meeting, I'm going to ask if Justin would come out so that we can have prayer together um, before he speaks for us this evening. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to ask that you be with Justin in a very special way this evening. We know that you've been with him as he's been preparing this message for us, and we just ask that you will speak through him to us tonight, that 
the words that we hear will be a blessing and that we'll be able to apply them to our lives, Father. We pray that in a special way we will sense the presence of the Holy Spirit here, that he will fall upon us, and that we will know without a doubt in our minds that the Lord was with us tonight. Please just help us to get a better glimpse of heaven as a result of what Justin has to say. We thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. That was bordering on pathetic. So I trust you're awake. Good evening. Much better. There's a lot of you out there. Praise the Lord for that. It's been, I think, just about a year since you and I met in a convention center much like this. For some of you, probably your first time to GYC. For others, maybe four, five, or even ten times. But it's been about 365 days since you and I met in a convention center. And I would submit to you, a lot has happened across our nation and across this world. For instance, did you know this year, since we last met, there have been seven, rather the seventh billion person alive on this planet was born? Some of you knew that, some of you didn't. You knew that, yes or no? Seven billion people! Can you believe that? Seven billion people on this planet. A person was born in the Philippines. The name is escaping me, but it's because of this, this exponential growth in the world population that people are beginning to doubt the Bible. They get all their collective wisdom together and they say, you know, seven billion people, it is impossible for the gospel to go to the world. And even Christians are saying this. Primarily, it resides on mainstream Christianity, but they're saying the collective wisdom is this. Seven billion people, it is impossible for the gospel to go to the world. And I would submit to you this. The edges of this foolishness, this this doubt in God is creeping into the Seventh-day Adventist church. That this gospel will not go to the world. But there's an army. There's an army of young people who believe, who know without a shadow of a doubt, this gospel will go to the world. Take, for instance, Australia. The young people in Australia are alive and well in the secular territory of Australia. Young people are getting together even as soon as next month. We've met with them here. They are putting forth evangelistic series to witness to the country of Australia. The young people are alive and well well in Australia. The young people in Australia refuse to believe in collective human wisdom and side with Matthew that this gospel will go to the world. You go north to Asia. You think of Asia, some of the most incredible territories, some of the most difficult challenges for us as a church. You head up to Australia and the young people are alive and well in Australia. You think of the Philippines, the young people are preaching their hearts out. By the thousands, they're being baptized in the Adventist church because of what young people are doing. You think of the mountains in Mongolia, they're preaching there. You think of the young ladies in China, they're preaching their hearts out. Our church is experiencing growth in China. Somebody better say amen. Amen. In China, the young people are preaching their hearts out despite the cost. The young people in Australia, they refuse to believe in collective human wisdom. They side with Matthew that this gospel will go to the world. You think of Africa. There in Africa, the young people are putting us to shame in America. A lot of times we think to ourselves, oh, we need to send missionaries to Africa. Let me assure you that is not the case. In most places in Africa, they should be sending their missionaries here. Somebody should say, amen, the young people in Africa are alive and well. You think of Zambia, impact. I always forget what it stands for. Inspired missionaries proclaiming the advent of Christ today. Since its inception two years ago, 3,500 people have been baptized in the church in Zambia. You think of Gabon, Ghana, Liberia. What am I trying to say? Yes, the young people are alive and well in there. You think of Ethiopia, the capital city, Addis Ababa. It is against the law to do evangelism. In August, 1,200 young people went out into the streets in the capital city of Ethiopia. The young people in Australia refuse to believe in collective human wisdom and side with Matthew that this gospel will go to the world. You head north into Europe, some of the most secular territory in the world. Did you know the young people are alive and well there? You think of Germany. I was with young people there in April. 12, no, 1,800 young people. 
And Sabbath afternoon, they rented a train and we, they went out into the streets in Mannheim, Germany. The young people are alive and well. You think of Norway and Sweden. Check this out. The youth department there. Every summer, they send up a group of young people in a bus. They go to northern Norway. Guess how many Adventists are there? Not one. They go, they spend their whole summer, and they're preaching their heart out, and they're baptizing people in northern Norway. Check this out. In Latvia, did you even know that was a country? Latvia, they get together. Almost every young person in the Seventh-day Adventist young person in that country gets together, has evangelistic outreach, and at their conference, guess what they do? They listen to the GYC recordings in Latvia doing evangelism. You know, we should do something in Europe. GYC in Europe? You probably wouldn't come, so it's irrelevant. The young people are alive and well in Europe. With or without GYC, the young people in Europe refuse to put any stock or credibility in collective human wisdom and side with Matthew that this gospel will go to the world. You think of South America, you can find the same enlightening stories. The young people are alive and well there. By the thousands, they come to Brazil. They preach in the mountains of Chile, the Peru, and Ecuador cities. The young people are going out and reaching out. The young people are alive and well in South America. They refuse to believe in collective wisdom. Seven billion, eight billion, 20 billion, it does not matter. This gospel will go to the world. And then the end shall come. And it's no reason that they should not put any stock in human credibility or, or human logic with the seven billion because it's been done before. Did you know that? This gospel has gone to the world before? Did you realize that? Check this out. You get to the book of Acts. They are in the upper room just before the Holy Spirit falls on them, just before they're praying out. And how many Bible students were in the upper room? You don't know? How many? How many? 120. 120 people. Now, at that time, when they were in the upper room, there was about 180 million people alive in the world. How many people? Come on, stay with me. How many people? Much better. So we have 120 in the upper room. We have 180 million on the world. The Holy Spirit descends on them and they begin to preach. You get into the next chapter of Acts and Peter preaches this bold, enlightening sermon and 3,000 are baptized into the church. You get to the next chapter, another 1,000 are baptized in the church. You read all through the book of Acts and there are hundreds, thousands, and tens of thousands baptized into the church. You get to the end of the book of Acts and there is just about one million Christians in the church that have been reached. One million. Someone should say amen. amen. So check this out. You have 120 and 180 million. For every one person, that is 1.4 million people they have to reach. You're tracking with me? 1.4 million. You get to the end of the book of the Acts, a book of Acts, 60 years later, there's a million Christians. That's one in every 180 people. Amen. Wow. Say amen. Amen. 180 people from 1.4 million to 180. Now check this out. How many Seventh-day Adventists are there in the world? Come on, you're Seventh-day Adventists. You're supposed to be sharp. Seventh-day Adventist excitement. How many? There's about 17 million. I heard all kinds of different numbers, but let's take 17 million. Some skeptic is sitting out there saying, yes, there's 17 million, but those aren't active. Fine. How many active, how many are active in the Adventist church? What percent? I hear anywhere from 10 to 50. So let's take the, the worst case scenario. Let's just say there's 50% of them that are, are active, okay? So we have, uh, what do we have? Eight and a half million active Seventh-day Adventists. You're tracking with me so far? Okay. We have seven billion people in the world. 7.5, no, 8.5, thank you. 8.5 divided by the 7 billion is 1 to 
823 people. It's easy. The disciples had 1.4 million people to reach. You only have 823. It actually ends up being 822.5. But some of you are going to have to be more aggressive and get to 824. But it's easy. It's been done before in the book of Acts already. It's no wonder that an army of young people can raise up around the world and say, we can do this. We can take the gospel to the world. We can take the gospel to the world. Let us pray. Blessed Father, here we are. We're in a convention center. We're in Houston, Texas. Nothing special about the room. Nothing special about the stage or the presenter. But it's special because you're here with us. It would be a mistake for us to invite you into this room because you were here before us. So we pause to invite you into our heart. We've come tonight for many different reasons. We've come tonight with many different backgrounds, coming from many different geographic locations, but we come united under the banner of the cross. Fill us our earnest plea. Fill us the individual plea for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. Our earnest plea coming together corporately as a movement to plea for the Holy Spirit on our, our behalf. Lord, tonight as you speak through me, I pray that the messenger would be minimized and the message would be maximized. That people wouldn't leave here saying Justin preached a good sermon, but they would leave here saying that they were touched by the throne of God. It's our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're heading to the book of Acts. I'll invite you to turn there with me. Acts is in the New Testament. You have Matthew, you have Mark, you have Luke, you have John, and then you get to the book of Acts. Acts, and we're going to be in the first chapter. Some of you are waiting for a, a cute little story or a, a funny analogy for the sermon to start with. You're not going to get one. Welcome to GYC. We go straight to the Word of God. Acts chapter 1. I typically start my presentations with a little bit of a warning. I am a layperson. What am I? A layperson, much like most of you. Now, because I'm a layperson, my formal education was not in the art of oral communication. You're tracking with me? So sometimes in my presentations, you get sermons that aren't uh, uh, typical. Tonight might be one of those times. Tonight we're going to do this. We are going to look at an effect to cause. What are we going to look at? Come on, young people. What are we going to look at? Effect to cause. So I would submit to you this. The effect is the gospel will go to the world. We looked in the introduction that it has been done before. You get to the book of Acts, thousands, hundreds are being baptized. I would submit to you this. The disciples started a revolution in the book of Acts. Amen? I would submit to you that this revolution must continue. It's not a revolution against our church. It's not a revolution against a political state. It is a revolution against the enemy, the adversary, Satan, and everything that he stands for. They started a revolution, and it must continue. Seven billion, eight billion, 20 billion, I don't care what the number is. The gospel will go to the world before Jesus comes again. It will happen before Jesus comes again. The Seventh-day Adventist church will deliver the three angels' message to the world. It will happen. The effect is the gospel going to the world. It will happen. But what I want to explore with you tonight is the cause. How does that happen? The effect is... We've laid the foundation. You're tracking with me? The, the, the foundation for our presentation is that the gospel will go to the world. You're with me, yes or no? Yes, yes or no? Yes. The gospel will go to the world. That is our foundation. We can now leave that because we want to understand why. How does that happen? So we're in the book of Acts. The disciples are in a little bit of a, a discombobulated state. 
They've just lost or they're just about to lose their master who they've spent following around for three and a half years. They relied on him for everything. Luke is just about to tell us how the Holy Spirit is going to descend on them. So we find the disciples at a bit of a crossroads in their Christian experience. They're unsure of the future. They're unsure of the next step. But they're on the cusp of some of the most exciting times of their life. Perhaps you might be able to sympathize or empathize with the disciples. You've come into this convention center tonight a little unsure of the future. Maybe it is a career path. You're at a crossroads and you don't know exactly where Jesus has you intended to go. You might be in a relationship, a little confused. Should I be in it? Should I not? You might have a family member who is just diagnosed with a disease or Worse yet, a family member that continues to ignore the plea of their Savior. Perhaps tonight you can empathize, you can sympathize with the disciples. But let me submit to you this. Exciting things are going to happen at this conference. Exciting things are going to happen at this conference. I've been working with GYC for the last seven years of my life. Seven conferences. Never Never have we had such problems leading up to a conference. You look at every department we have, and there is some colossal, not failure, because that's the wrong word, that that would lead you to believe it is some human type of thing, but there is some sort of objection that the devil has placed there. Every department, take for instance the the, uh, logistics department, registration. For many of you, it was a nightmare. Don't say yes or no. (laughs) It was a nightmare. All I can do is apologize and promise you we'll do everything in our power so that it doesn't happen to you again. But here's the appeal. God wants to do exciting things through this conference. God wants to do exciting things through this conference, and there is an enemy who is trying to distract us. But we're not going to let him. We're not going to focus on the registration or the food or whatever else it is that is standing in the way. We're going to focus on the creator who's bigger than those. We're going to focus on the savior who's bigger than any of those problems. God is going to do incredible things through this conference. Your life may be on the cusp of greatness just like the disciples. You may be in this room with some sort of problem, some sort of confusion, some sort of lack of direction just like the disciples, but they are on the cusp of greatness. It could be that you are too. It could be that... Jesus has something impressive that's about to happen in your life. God will do incredible things through this conference. We're in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. You're there, yes or no? Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. He presented himself alive. Bible students, who is it that's presenting himself alive? Who is it? Jesus. Jesus, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering for many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of who? Come on. The kingdom of who? You're at GYC. Stick with me. The kingdom of God. Now, I love the foundation that that Luke builds in his letter. He's writing to his letter to Theophilus. I might be saying that incorrectly, so I apologize. But he's writing a letter, and here's the foundation. Listen, he says. Listen up, readers. What's about to happen in the book of Acts is all from the foundation because Jesus suffered on the cross and Jesus rose again. Everything you're going to find from Acts going forward from this foundation is because of what Jesus did on the cross. You know, we have a very passionate executive committee. We're all youth. We're all volunteers. And because of that, we get some real passionate debate. Did you know that? It takes us about 14 months to plan a conference like this. We've already started planning our next conference in Seattle. We have some exciting things to unveil on Saturday night to you about it, but I'm not going to tell you yet. We have some passionate debate, and especially when it comes to theme. Now, undoubtedly, let me let let you a little peek into the executive committee table. We'll be sitting around the table. It'll be time for the theme discussion. And one man who will go unnamed always comes up with this. All the elocution in the world, all the logic he can possibly pour into a themed thought. He says, guys, I think we need a theme on Jesus only. And inevitably, Sebastian's idea (laughs) 
Sorry, the man was going to go unnamed. <laughs> Sorry, Sebastian. Inevitably, Sebastian's idea gets shot down. Not because it's not a fantastic idea, not because it's not something that we should focus on, but the logic is this. And don't miss this, young people. Jesus had better be at the center of every one of our themes. Jesus had better be at the foundation of everything that we do. We as a movement, as GYC, the cross, Christ's suffering, Christ's resurrected should be at the foundation of everything that we do. And a theme is no different. Fill me our earnest plea at the heart of it, at the center of it, at the foundation of it is Jesus' suffering on the cross and Jesus' resurrection. Luke says, listen up, reader. The reason that this happens, the reason that Jesus has the authority to speak to us is because he suffered on the cross. Listen up, young people. The reason that you and I can cry out, fill me, our earnest plea, is because of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Make no mistake about it. There will be a group of individuals called the Adventist Church who near the end of time will be crying out, fill me, because of what Jesus did for them at the cross. There will be an army of young people assembled known as the, gener known as the Generation Youth Christ, GYC, who will pray out earnestly, fill me, because of what Jesus did for them at the cross. The only question that remains unanswered, will you as a child, as a son or as a daughter of Christ, cry out individually, fill me, because of what he did for you at the cross. Paul employs some fascinating language to communicate the same idea. Galatians chapter 6, I think it's verse 14, he says, listen, listen up. He's just alerted us to the fact that he's writing in bigger letters, partly because of his eyesight, but partly because I think he doesn't want us to miss it. He says, listen up, far be it from me to boast in anything but the cross. Translation, it's because of the cross that I had my conversion on the road to Damascus. It's because of the cross that I could preach to the Jews and the Gentiles. It's because of the cross that even from a damp, mildewy, forsaken prison that I could write to you. Far be it from me to boast in anything but the cross. Jesus only, it better be at the heart, it better be at the center, and it better be at the foundation of everything that we do. Jesus only. Head to the book of Peter. First Peter, it is a letter written by Peter. It is typically used for those who are suffering. But I just love how Peter takes this concept of the Holy Spirit and the foundation of Jesus on the cross and brings it full circle. First Peter, turn there quickly. First Peter, we're in chapter 1, verse 10. You're there, yes or no? Yes. We'll wait so that everyone can catch up. First Peter, chapter 1, and verse 10. First Peter 1, and verse 10. Amen. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace. Now, Bible students, what prophets is he talking to? What prophets wrote about Jesus' coming and Jesus' grace? Who is it? Isaiah. Isaiah might be one. I would say the whole Old Testament prophets. So he's alerting us to the fact, listen up, the Old Testament prophets wrote about grace, wrote about Jesus' work here. We're reading on that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person of time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he predicted the what? Glory. Come on, young people, the what? My, my, my translation renders it the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. The Old Testament prophets prophesied about Jesus to come, Jesus' work on the cross, Jesus' suffering, Jesus' resurrection, and all that goes with it. Then you get to Jesus. He comes here. He walks with us. And Jesus alerts us to the fact in John 10 and verse 10 that he came so that we and you and I might have life, but not just life, life more abundantly. And then he goes on to say some very remarkable and very thought-provoking things to the disciples. He says, listen, guys, it's to your advantage that I leave you. You remember this, yes or no? Yes. Let's go look at it. Hold your finger in First Peter, but go to John. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. No, that's not right. 16. You get to John chapter 14, you go to John chapter 16. We'll read verse 7 for some context. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. It is to your what? Amen. 
advantage that I go away for if I do not go away the helper who do you and I know to be the helper the Holy Spirit will not come to you but if I go I will send him to you now Jesus comes to the disciples and says listen guys I know you relied on me for so long I know that you relied on me for everything that you do whether it be food whether it be direction you followed me I am your master but listen it's to your advantage that I go away now, you and I have the, uh, the privilege, I would say, to know the end of the story, yes? We know exactly what Jesus is referring to, but think of the disciples. Here they are relying on Jesus for everything, and Jesus is saying, listen, listen, I've got to go away, and it's to your advantage. But the understanding is this. What if Jesus had left immediately at that instant? Would it have been to their advantage? Yes or no? It's a trick question because we really don't know. The answer is we cannot answer that because we do not know. But we can answer is this. Jesus is referring to the fact that soon he would die on the cross for all their sins. Soon he would resur be resurrected and go to the throne of God and then be able to send the Holy Spirit. Check this out. He, he gives us the answer. Verse 14. He, speaking of who, who were we just talking about? Who is it? The Holy Spirit, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare to you, verse 15, all that the Father has is mine, therefore I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus says it's to your advantage. I'll die on the cross for your sins. I'll be resurrected after three days. I'll go to the throne of God for you, and I'll send my helper, the Holy Spirit, for you. Why is the Holy Spirit going to come? To remind you of what I did. Back in 1 Peter, verse 12. It was, revealed, it was revealed to them, remember we're talking about the Old Testament prophets, that they were serving not themselves, but who? Who is it? Us. Us. You. You. It's beautiful, isn't it? Amen. The grace of Christ was revealed to the Old Testament prophets, not just for them, but for you and I. Jesus came so that we might have a life and more life more abundantly. The Holy Spirit came down to remind us of what he did. And this was all done not primarily for the Old Testament prophets, not primarily for the disciples, not primarily for the apostles in the book of Acts, but for you and I. Amen. It was revealed to them that they were serving not for themselves, but for you. Christ, the foundation of our lives and the foundation of our earnest plea. Remember with me tonight, we're looking at a effect to cause, yes? yes? Effect to cause, is anyone looking at that with me? Yes. Come on, young people. We're at GYC. The effect is the gospel will go to the world, and I would submit to you one of the causes of that is Jesus being at the foundation, Jesus being at the center, Jesus being at the absolute foundation and center of everything that we possibly do. Amen. We're back in Acts, Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. This is about to get exciting. And while staying with them, he ordered them. You may be reading from the King James Version or the New King James Version, and that renders it, he commanded them. Now, I don't know about you, but when the Bible says that Jesus ordered them or Jesus commanded them, I tend to listen up. You do the same, yes or no? He commanded them to do what? Not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. Now. Before we unpackage what I think is a significant command, a significant order from Christ, it's time for a little look in the mirror. You ready for that? A little look in the mirror of the millennial generation. A few months ago, Sebastian put me onto this fantastic book. It's called The M Factor. What is it called? The M Factor. The M Factor. And what it does is it describes some of the things that the millennial generation look for. Now, I am part of the millennial generation, and the majority of you out there are part of the millennial generation. You may put, uh, be put on some of the edges of it, but indeed, the majority of us are part of the millennial generation. Now, this book, The M Factor, the subtitle is something to the effect how the millennial generation is rocking the workplace. Basically what it does, it looks at the millennial generation as a whole, and it assigns some, some attributes that would be 
uh, something that all the generation would primarily look at, or, or be a part of, rather. So the first one is this. We as a millennial generation, we like access. What do we like? Access. access. And that is to say this. Our parents may have started with a very small, modest, uh, poor home, if you will. And eventually they worked up into a nicer home. Well, the millennial generation, you and I come along and we say, we don't want to start down there where they were. We want to start where they, w where they ended up and rise from there. You're tracking with me? So we typically demand access. The other thing that we like to do is we like to rally. What do we like to do? Rally. rally. Especially if there's some element where we can change the world. So you and I as a generation, we demand access, we like to rally, and we like to change the world. Does that kind of sound like some of us? Yeah. Yes? No? It's, it's, it's not necessarily to say that every person in the millennial generation is like this by any stretch of the imagination, but as a broad stroke, that's kind of what we're like. Now, it's with those things in mind that we look again at the command of Jesus. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, while he's staying with them, he ordered them, he commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem. Now, isn't that fascinating? Jesus has just delivered the, the great gospel commission. Listen, guys, disciples, go and preach everywhere, but wait. Go and make sure that everyone in the inhabitable globe knows who I am and what I've done on the cross, but wait. Before you can take the next step, you must reach Jerusalem. You must reach the very people you are already in contact with. Amen. And you and I as a church have been commissioned by Christ to take the three angels' message to the world. But could it be that you and I, as a church, are a like, lot like the disciples were? Hmm. Could it be that the disciples were there on the cusp of greatness, just about to have the Holy Spirit poured on them and go through some of the most exciting times of their life? Could it be that our church emulates that today? You know, as a church, we believe that the, the Holy Spirit will come again in this latter rain form. You'll learn more about it tomorrow, so I don't want to dive too much into it and, and spoil the rest of the conference, but it's going to happen. We as a church believe that it's going to happen. So, check this out. The disciples are there. They're in this, this state of, of awareness. They have just been delivered the gospel message, but Jesus commands them, wait, reach Jerusalem. So could it be that you and I as a church, as we wait for the Holy Spirit to, be, to descend again, as we wait for the latter rain power to come out again, could it be that Jesus is commanding us to wait? Let's keep looking at this. Here's the beef. The Loma Linda veggie beef, of course. <laughs> Most of us in the millennial generation are not prepared to wait. Most of us, quite possibly even in this room, are not prepared to wait. You say, no, <laughs> Justin, that's not the case. Jesus commands me to do something, I'm there. I'm all in. He tells me to wait, I'm going to wait. Check this out. What if I told you tonight we start rallying for the world? Tonight we rally and in 10 days we can change the world. I can see it in my mind's eye. Occupy Houston Convention Center. Right here in this room. 10 days we rally. 10 days we stay. In 10 days we can change the world. In 10 days we'll have Alana. She'll prepare these nice meticulous meals where we'll go through the line and we'll eat together. Sean will have programming running around the clock. And every afternoon, Chelsea will organize outreach where the west side of the room will go and reach the east side of the room. 10 days we rally. 10 days we change the world. Are you with me, yes or no? Come on, show your hands. Will you rally with me? We will change the world. Yes or no? Raise your hand. Show them high. The majority of you would do that. So check this out. Same scenario. We rally. We're going to make a big difference. We're going to change something. We're going to rally, and then Alana will have the meals. Sean will have the programming around the clock. Chelsea, maybe this time she'll do the outreach from the west to the east side of the room each afternoon. Ten days we rally, and at the end of ten days, you double the attendance at your prayer meeting. Who's with me? A significantly amount less. Now let me ask this question. You can't raise your hand unless you've been to 12 prayer meetings at your local church. That's one a month. 
who's with me. Still some, but could you picture if we asked that question to all the Seventh-day Adventists? Jesus commands them to wait, to hold on, to reach locally, stay in Jerusalem. Translation, you have no business making plans to reach the world when your prayer meeting in your church is suffering. You have to revitalize it. As young people, this is for you. I wholeheartedly believe in the mission, of our, the mission for us as Seventh-day Adventist young people living right now is to revitalize our local church, to bring about reformation in our local church, to bring about revival in our local church. We must bring about revival in our local church. Jesus commands them to stay in Jerusalem. Translation, reach your local church. Some of you say, well, i have called to be a foreign missionary. That's fine. I'm not talking about you. Your, your Jerusalem is temporarily on the move. Some of you say, listen, I've got to go on short-term mission trips. That's fine with me. Go on Maranatha. Go on Share Him. We even have some with GYC. Do that. What I am talking about are those of you who sit in the Adventist church each Sabbath and are doing nothing to revitalize your local church. You fill a pew each Sabbath but you do nothing to bring about revival in your local church. We have great aspirations of preaching to the thousands, but we won't preach to the one. We have great aspirations of reaching the world, but our prayer meeting is dead. We have great aspirations of preaching to the thousands, but our church does not have a Pathfinder program. We have great aspirations to preach to the thousands, but our Sabbath school is dull. Jesus commands them, stay in Jerusalem. And it's a winning concept. Look at Acts verse 1 and verse 8 with me. Excuse me, chapter 1 and verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Did you catch it? For the disciples to reach the world, they had to reach around them. The disciples, according to the book of Acts, were waiting for the Holy Spirit to be poured out, much like us as a church. They had to reach to Jerusalem, their local church, then to Judea, their local state, then to Samaria, their country, which eventually led them to reach the world. So wouldn't it be a logical conclusion that as you and I as a congregation, as a movement, are waiting for the Holy Spirit to be poured out again, that we would be reaching out locally? That before we had any aspirations of reaching the world, our workplace has been touched. Before we started even thinking about a neighboring country, our neighborhood was reached. That before we had aspirations of reaching the world, our family members were reached. Listen, this appeal rings true to my heart. I'm not doing enough for my local church. My wife and I had an evangelistic series in in the fall at our church. Little town of 3,000 people, 30 visitors. Some of them were our family members that aren't Adventists. I'm not doing enough to reach my local church. Remember, we're looking at an effect to cause. The effect is the gospel going to the world. The cause is Christ being at the center of everything that we do. And the cause is to reach out to our local church, to revitalize it. For the disciples, it was world, Samaria, Judea, Jerusalem. For you and I, world, country, state, city, local church. You want to reach the world? You have to reach your local church. You want to rally for the world? You have to rally for your church. You want to change the world? You have to change your local church. World, country, state, city, local church. It was 11 or 12 or 13 months ago, something like that, and I was in the city of Rome on a Reformation trip. Now, for whatever reason, I'm not a person that just enjoys sitting idly in my hotel room, and so this particular night, jet lag was sitting in. It was the middle of the day for me. It was the middle of the night in Rome, but you're there in a city, and what are you going to do? You're not going to just sit in your room. So I laced up my walking shoes and I began to walk around the city. 
three or four hours that night, I walked around the entire city. And, and when you're in a city like that with so much history, so many exposed relics, you tend to get very reflective. What was it that they had? What did the early apostles, the, the early martyrs, the early Christians, what did they have? I remember walking around the Colosseum in that particular night, there were these big screens, much like the ones we have here, with, with fire that was being projected on them to simulate what you and I know as Nero burning the city. Walked around the Colosseum thinking to myself, there were Christians. There were Christians who were dressed up as lambs as lions were released in the Colosseum. How would I have responded to that? I remember walking through the garden, the, the very garden where Christians were dipped in tar and used as, as, as torches, thank you, as torches to light up the garden. How would I have responded to that? remember walking to the courtyard where, where Christians were tied and, and chariots would race opposite directions, literally tearing Christians apart. How would I have responded to that? What, what was it that these, these Christians have? How could it that they could continue to reach even though this was happening to them? How could they continue to reach as they were being dressed up as lambs? How could they be, continue to preach as they, were dressed, as they were dipped in tar? And by extension, how could they do it in the book of Acts? How could they preach when eventually they were martyred? How could they reach out when their critics were trying to silence them? How could they reach out when Christians were trying to silence them? What did they have? Was it the Holy Spirit? Because that always seems to be sort of a byproduct of the Acts church. What did they have? How could they continue to reach? And it finally hit me. I was there at the church where it's built over where they believe Paul was imprisoned. Just earlier that day, I had gone down into that, that prison. I could still taste the dampness of that prison. I could feel, still feel the slime on the walls of the rocks of that prison. You can't even stand up. It's this, this condensed hole in the ground. What did Paul have? How could he write such thought-provoking and convicting messages? How could he glorify Christ from the, from the jail cell in a hole in the ground? And I stood up looking at that church. And I remember the realization of what they had. It was so simple, so beautiful, that the truth was undeniable. The disciples, the apostles, they could continue to reach because they were reached. They could continue to reach because they were reached. They were 100% committed to Christ. They lived for Him and Him alone. They didn't have earthly commitments or priorities tying them down. They were reached. And here's the fascinating thing. It's the logical next step to the equation in the book of Acts. It's a logical equation to the gospel going to the world. World, country, state, city, local church. You. 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 Young people, you want to reach the world? You have to be reached. Older people, you want to take the three angels' message to the world? You have to be reached. You. We alluded to it in the introduction. Peter preaches a mighty, earth-shattering sermon in the book of Acts. 3,000 were baptized into the church. But I would submit to you this. Peter wasn't always so bold. Peter wasn't always sold out to God's will. Peter wasn't always so reached. We're heading in conclusion to the night's presentation to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 22.
Luke chapter 22. We'll set the scene just a little bit. Again, the critics of Jesus in an attempt to silence him, an attempt to limit his access here on this earth, they've arrested him. They've brought him to the home of the high priest, and they're there in front of the, the high priest's home. And in those days, they didn't have TVs. They didn't have well-insulated homes. So when there's a ruckus going outside like this, people want to know what's going on. So as Jesus is being dragged to this, this high priest's home, there's quite a multitude, if you will, that's following him. Probably a lot of them out of curiosity, but, but we picture in this multitude of people Peter. Peter's sort of slinking along, trying to just blend in with the crowd. Peter trying to slink along, not being noticed, just, just wanting to observe Christ. They get up to the high priest's home, and there's a, a fire that's kind of kindled to the side. So Peter ducks in behind the fireplace, and, and in our mind's eye, we can picture a fire. We can picture many people gathered around it, and we can picture Peter in the midst of them. Peter just kind of ignoring everyone else, minding his own business. We can picture everyone's breast being projected because it's cold outside and, and they're just trying to warm up from the fire. Peter's there just, just warming up and soon Peter feels it. That, that glare of eyes penetrating him. And most of you have been in that situation in a public setting where, where maybe it was on a bus or an airplane or, or some sort of park where there's a lot of people. Soon you can sense it when people are staring at you, can't you? You've ever been in that situation, yes or no? Yeah, you can kind of picture it. You can feel it. And then Peter's he's, he's put in this awkward situation where he doesn't want to look at them. He wants to avoid the awkward eye contact. So in my mind's eye, I picture Peter sort of overshooting the glance. You've done that before, too. You overshoot the glance, you look at something off in the distance, Peter's glaring out into darkness, and then, then he brings his eyes down to the person where he feels like they're looking at him, and sure enough, awkward eye contact. <laughs> Glaring, penetration eyes. And you'll remember something. Actually, let's just read the verse for the context, Luke 22 and verse 56 says this, then a servant girl seeing him, they lock eyes, a servant girl seeing him, he sat in the light and looking closely at him said this, this man also was with him. This man right here that I'm looking at, he was with Jesus. Listen, sir, you were with Jesus. And remember Peter's first response, turn to Matthew very quickly, hold your finger in Luke. But look at Matthew 26, just moments, just hours, maybe even just minutes before. Matthew 26 and verse 34, Jesus says to him, to Peter, Truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me how many times? Three times. But Peter says to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Lord, listen, there may be other people out there who are going to deny you, but it's not going to be me. Listen, Jesus, I've spent three and a half years with you. I'm committed to you. I'm committed to your will. I will not deny you. It's not going to happen. Each of the disciples said the same. So with that in our context, we head back to the awkward glaze at the fireplace. Luke 22 and verse 57 now. But he denied it. He what? He denied it saying, woman, I do not know him. If that wasn't enough, you find a second incident. Someone looks at him and says, listen, you must be the one. I do not know him, Peter says. Finally, a third time, it is you. It must be you. We know it is you. I do not know him. Three times, Peter explains, I do not know Christ. I do not know Christ. I do not know Christ. Just after saying, I would never do it. And I don't know about you, but I look at this story and I'm frustrated. I'm irritated. Peter, how could you do it? Three and a half years you spent with Jesus Christ. He's just about to die on the cross for all your sins, all of my sins. How could you deny him? Three and a half years, Peter, couldn't you be converted? Couldn't you have been reached? How is it that you can deny him? Peter, you fool. Why would you do it? And I'm gently reminded 
There's a little bit of Peter's personality in me. You've been in those situations. I have. Listen to a sermon. Maybe it's even at a GYC. The appeal comes and I commit. I'm going to do more of that. Could be more time in the Word of God. Could be more time in prayer. But I commit. I'm going to do it. As soon as the sermon's over, the conference is over, I'm back, swept into the crowd, avoiding the awkward eye contact. Maybe you can relate to Peter. Maybe it was even at last GYC, the Sunday charge. You committed to give something up. Christ came, he convicted you. The Holy Spirit convicted you of something that was in your life that was misdirecting your priorities. You say, I'd rather die than do that again. But you get back home, get swept into the crowd. You avoid the awkward eye contact because you don't want to remember your commitment. Maybe it's a sermon in, in church. Your pastor has just preached a sermon that you know is tailor-made to you. You commit in your life to do something more or give something up. You're not committing to a, a preacher. You're not committing to a pulpit. You're not committing to a well-executed, logical, thought-progressing sermon. You're committing to your Savior, committing to your Creator. Some of you have been with Him for more than three and a half years. Come forward on the appeal, I'll do it, Lord. I'll give it up, Lord. As soon as Sunday comes around, you're swept back into the multitude that just wants to see what's going on. You avoid the awkward eye contact. You see, the, Peter, the story of Peter angers us because we can relate. The story of Peter irritates us because it reminds us of ourselves. Peter, you fool! Because we act like a fool. But check this out. There's hope. There was hope for Peter and there's hope for you and I. Peter comes to the upper room. He's at a significant crossroads in his life. His life up, up to this point in his juncture, up to this point in his Christian experience, was not fully reached. He gets to the upper room and he cries out in his own words, Fill me! Fill me! Fill me! Lord, I'm full of, of self ex, or, uh, ego. My ego is boastful. Lord, take it from me. Lord, I rely on myself. I want to rely on you. Take it from me. Cries out in the upper room, fill me. His disciples press in close to him. Fill him, Lord. Fill him. He wants to give up his self-indignation. Fill him. It was one of the most humble and earnest prayers ever recorded in the Bible. Fill him. Fill me. And from the pen of Ellen White, she says this. Now, speaking about Peter, now his self-confidence was gone. Never again were the old boastful assertions repeated. There was hope for Peter and there's hope for you and I. I'm reading from our 10 Days in the Upper Room, page 70, the book that you will be reading for your devotions. The author says this, Peter was a different man after Pentecost, amen? He no longer trembled in fear at the accusations of the officers of the temple. When he was confronted by the religious leaders and they demanded that he stop preaching in Jesus' name, the apostle responded, we ought to obey God rather than man. Like his master, Peter's single-minded ambition was to do the will of his heavenly father. The disciples were passionate about doing Jesus' will. The disciples were passionate about doing Jesus' will. The gospel will go to the world. It's the end game, the, the, the final conclusion, if you will, to this earth's history. The gospel will go to the world. Make no mistake about it. It's going to take a, a centered belief in Christ 
on the cross, remembering his suffering, remembering his resurrection, Christ, Jesus only, the heart and center of everything that we do. It's going to take a passion, a devotion, and a sacrifice to your local church. Jesus commanded them to stay. Stay in Jerusalem. Jesus commanded them to stay in Jerusalem. Then you reach the world. Reach your local church. Reach your local workplace. Reach your local neighborhood. Then you reach the world. World, country, state, city, local church. You. You want to reach the world? You have to be reached. Listen, the disciples were ready to lay it all on the line. They were willing to face persecution. They were willing to face imprisonment. They were willing to face even death. All these things they were living for were worth dying for. What about you? Are the things that you're living for worth dying for? Are the priorities in your life worth dying for? I'm going to invite the Neblets to come out and sing a song to us. They're going to come up, and I want you to think about this. Peter came to the upper room full of this, this ego, and gave it up. Never again, she says, never again did it happen. For many of us, there's something in our life, some priority that we need to give up. I don't know what it is for you, but certainly the Holy Spirit does. As they sing our song, you're going to think about this. Throughout this conference, what is it that you should give up? What priority in your life is misaligned? What priority in your life needs to be pushed out? We can't do it ourselves. But as we're crying out, fill me our earnest plea, it can flee from us never to come again. You see, the disciples, the things they were living for, were worth them dying for. Are the things you're living for worth dying for? Are the priorities in your life worth dying for? And I'll leave you with this thought-provoking question to think about as they sing. There's an author, there's an evangelist, and etched on his tombstones is this thought-provoking question. Leonard Ravenhill, he says this, are the things in your life worth Christ dying for? Are the things you live for worth Christ dying for? Are the priorities in your life worth Christ dying for? Are the things in your life worth Christ dying for? Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what Thou dost love, and do what Thou wouldst do. Breathe on
Did God speak to your heart this evening? Did you hear his voice? And did his spirit reach down and invade your heart? Each evening as we conclude, we're going to take some time, some significant time, to spend in prayer. Our conferences fill me our earnest plea. That's a prayer. And we want to spend time seeking God's face each evening. Alvin, Amy, and myself are going to, to lead us in prayer this evening. And I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with us to Joel chapter 2. And we're going to spend, as I mentioned, some significant time in prayer. And, and we're going to kneel here on stage. You may want to kneel where you are. It may be a little hard. And if you'd like to, to sit, that's fine as well. But get comfortable because we're going to spend some time with our Lord this evening in prayer. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 is referenced in Peter's Day of Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2. We're going to focus on three verses this evening as we seek God's face tonight. Verses 15, 16, and 17. So I'm going to invite you, if you're comfortable, to kneel where you are. We'll kneel here on the platform, and you're welcome to kneel or sit where you are this evening. In Joel chapter 2, verse 15... God's message is, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly. God has called a solemn assembly. During the next four days, this will be a solemn assembly. So I want to invite you to take some time just privately, silently praying to the Lord and say, Lord, what is it? What is it that I have brought in the recesses of my mind that is going to distract from me being able to enter into this solemn assembly. I want to invite you to pray, Lord, help me to take this seriously. As I'm walking to my hotel room tonight, Lord, help me to keep my mind fixed on you. Lord, help me take this seriously. Would you do that right now? Would you ask Lord to empower you to take this conference very, very seriously in your life? 